1900, 1900, covered by railroad tracks, gigantic grain <laughs> silos, and factories belching smoke. Not a very pretty sight. So into this hot mess comes Daniel Burnham, an architect, an urban planner, and a visionary. And Burnham says, we're going to make Chicago into Paris on the prairie. He develops a plan to guide the growth of the city. One of the first things that he calls for is to build that bridge in front of us to connect the thriving downtown that was already established on your left to renew the right-hand side of the river with high-end residential offices and retail. The bridge, designed by Edward Bennett, which will go under in just a minute, building with the clock tower rent went up. This is the Wrigley building designed by Graham Anderson Probst and White. This is architecture inspired by the past. The clock tower is modeled on one in Seville, Spain from the 15th century. And the building is clad in six different shades of white terracotta tiles. Terracotta means baked earth, has the virtue of being fireproof. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Architecture inspired by the past. A contrast to the building on your right with the Fidelity sign on it. And this is architecture inspired by the new materials that became available in the middle of the 20th century. And this is mid-century modernism. And you've seen buildings like this all over the world. Dark steel, dark glass, rectangular in shape, usually with flat tops. And the mid-century modernists took advantage of those new materials they believe that when you fit them together with great care and precision, they had a beauty all their own. They didn't need any other ornamentation. So all the shapes and things you see sticking out of the Wrigley Building, which was designed by Graham Anderson, Probst, and White, they're deleted from the building with the Fidelity sign on it, which is from the 1960s, designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. And that mid-century modern movement was championed by Mies Van <laughs> That's Captain Tom telling us we're going to get going. Championed by Mies van der Rohe, who came to Chicago from his native Germany in the 1930s, spent the rest of his life here leading modernism. And the, you probably heard the mantra of the mid-century modernists. You know, they wanted to sort of just get rid of all that ornamentation. The mantra, of course, less is more. And that's sort of the, the credo that the mid-century modernists live by. So as we start to pull out from the dock, I do want to come back to the Apple Building, a beautiful contemporary design from Foster and Partners, architects London-based, working very closely with the in-house designers at Apple. When they designed the building, they said, we want an architectural statement, but instead of one that shouts, we want it to whisper its elegance. And I think this building does a beautiful job of that. It's all encircled in glass. The glass is, in fact, four panes of glass laminated to each other, so it's like ply glass, the same way you think of ply wood. It provides the support for that roof, along with four columns on the inside. And they really sort of blur the, you take a look at the steps coming down from the plaza above. It sort of blurs the difference between the inside and the outside with that glass surround. And if you think the roof of that building looks a little bit like the top of an Apple laptop computer, eh, you wouldn't be wrong, right? As we pull out, take a look on your left, another style of architecture, the brown limestone tower going soaring upward. This is an example of Art Deco. This is from the 20s, and Art Deco really emphasizes its verticality. It wants to look very tall, and you can see the windows are recessed. The vertical elements between them go up uninterrupted, as does your eye, and the ornamentation is carved into the lower base and the upper base. So again, nothing interrupts your eye as it goes up, and it really puts its full emphasis on its vertical dimension. Now as we come out, yeah, they're all going to be waving to you throughout the cruise. You can wave back. As we come out from under the bridge, take a look at your left, and you'll see a building with columns in front of it, and it's got a curved front. This is the London Guarantee and Accident Assurance Building from 1923, designed by Alfred Allshuler. And now you can see it has the name London House on the front. 
Those columns up at the top may remind you of Greek temples. So this is another style of architecture also inspired by the past. Uh, it was championed by the School of Fine Arts of Paris. Fine Arts translates to Beaux-Arts. We call this the Beaux-Arts style inspired by the Greek and Roman traditions. Columns, arches, symmetry, and highly ornamental roofs. And you can see that temple way up on the top there. That is called the Belvedere, which means beautiful view because you have exquisite views looking up and down the river. This building stood as an office building for the London Guarantee Insurance Company for nearly 100 years, but it is now another example of renewal by putting a new building inside an old one. A few years ago, they converted it to the London House Hotel, and now it's a place to stay if you're in the heart of downtown. I just want to let you know, I'm talking about mainly about buildings we're going to be seeing on the left, but we come back through here, so don't worry, you'll, you'll get a good description when we come back through of buildings that we're seeing now on the right. Another very striking building on the left, the one with the big tower in the middle and then one smaller tower on each of its corners. This is the Jewelers Building, 1926, designed by Yeager and Dinkelberg, and it was occupied by jewelers when it was first built. And they had some very specific needs. They needed to get their jewelry and gold home safely every night, because they'd take it with them. So how did they do that? Did they pack it up in a case, walk onto the elevator where their car was parked in the elevator waiting for them, downstairs, drive home, reverse the process the next morning, come back, always keeping their jewelry safe, no, the car elevators are long gone from that building, but now they're, they're freight elevators, so they, they still serve their purpose. Now you can see on the left, uh, all the folks walking along the river walk. Did anybody here happen to make their way along the river walk when they went to get the tickets and come to the boat? I see a few hands going up. Thank you for doing that. Those who didn't, if you have time afterwards, it's a beautiful walk. It's pretty busy today, of course. But that Riverwalk is new. It was built from about 2006 to 16. The lead designer, Carol Ross Barney and Associates. And the reason that it's new is because for most of the life of the city of Chicago, this river was a stinky, dirty body of water and nobody wanted to get near it, and they didn't. But it's been cleaned up a lot. The Riverwalk was pushed by several uh, successive mayors of Chicago, and it really has now been fully completed just a few years ago. And it's a wonderful amenity that reconnects the people of the city as well as the visitors back to the river and a reminder of how wonderful this excursion can be walking along here. And each space between the bridges is called a room. They have different purposes. We have Vietnam Veterans Memorial just back there. And up ahead, you'll see one that I'll describe. It's like a, a riverside theater. But now I want to point out a building on the left. Up on the top, it's got white vertical elements and it's got a big triangle up on the top, up ahead of us on the left. This is an example of postmodernism. So the postmodernists came along in the 70s and 80s and they rejected modernism, that fidelity building we saw at the beginning. They said, we don't think every building needs to look the same. We think it's okay to refer to historic architectural styles. You might think that triangle up on top reminds you a little bit of the Parthenon. This building has been called the Parthenon on steroids. And we think it's okay to reintroduce ornamentation. So if you look at the vertical elements, which you'll see again in a second, they sort of look like columns, but they're clearly not columns that are supporting the building itself. But they're bringing back that idea of ornamentation. So where the mid-century modernists said, less is more, the postmodernists said, less is a bore. Let's have some fun with our architecture. Let's bring back some historical references and ornamentation. And another principle that I'll describe about postmodernism in just a few minutes about how it relates to the environment around it. We've got another interesting Art Deco building coming up on the left. Again, it's a brown limestone tower and it's just on the other side of this bridge. But we're also, this is the river theater that I mentioned, this next room on the left-hand side where all the steps are. That's actually, they, they'll bring up barges in front of there in the evenings during the summertime and do performances, and those become the seats for the river theater. But the building behind it with the American flag right over the entrance is the LaSalle Wacker building from 1930, designed by Holliburton and Root. And if you, if you look at the shape of this building, uh, it almost looks like the throne of a king or queen. 
Now, it wasn't designed to look that way, but it came out that shape because of some new regulations that were passed in the early 20s. As more and more skyscrapers were going up around the city, they were afraid it would leave all the streets in shadow. So as a result, you have the tallest part of the tower is set back. That allows the light to reach the street, and we're not all walking around in the darkness on other days of the year when it's not quite as sunny as it is today. And you can see how these Art Deco towers really soar up in a, in a sort of unbroken vertical emphasis. It's down over here after all the hustle bustle back by the docks. It's really nice. It's always a little calmer as you get into the evening here. So I said there are a couple of other principles of postmodernism that are illustrated by the next two buildings that I want to talk about. First one, second one on the other side of the next bridge. It's sort of got like two needles coming up in the front corners of it. And take a look between where those two needles are up at the top. You can see sort of a curved piece and then a horizontal piece immediately above that curved piece. That's intended to be a replica of a bridge because one of the other principles of postmodernism is to acknowledge the environment around a building. So you've got all the bridges along the river here that we're passing under. And so the designers of that building, an architectural firm named KPF, originally called Pedersen Fox, they wanted to involve, you know, bring that into the design. The next building on the left after that, which we'll see as we sort of hit the junction of the river up ahead, it, for many years this was voted by the people of Chicago their favorite building. It's the one with the green curved front, and it illustrates, it is, it is a great example of a building that is specifically designed to stand exactly where it's standing. The curve of the front echoes the curve of the river in front of it. The color of the glass is very similar to the color of the water in the river in front. It is literally reflecting the buildings across from it. And if you look near the bottom, you can see the gray and black stone. Now what's behind that stone is the building mechanical, the heating, ventilating, air conditioning systems. That equipment is typically up at the top of a building. So why is it down at the bottom of this one? You're getting a clue. You see that train going by there? That's the pink line. It's going by, it's got a big sign on it that I can't quite read from here. It's about a movie or something. That, the pink and the green lines go across that rail line about 500 times a day. So can you imagine if you had an office on the second or third floor of this building with the rail cars going, you, you know, you go crazy, okay? So the architects realized that when they were designing it. They pr protected people from not having to experience that by putting the building mechanical there, and everything worked out well. And this continues to be, you know, one of the most beautiful buildings in the city. But it has, it has been challenged in the last few years. So we're coming into the junction now by several other buildings that have been designed and built right here at the junction, which is sort of the historic, historic heart of the city. And you can see this last tower going up right now. We'll talk about that when we come back through here. This is Wolf Point, but here over on your right, where this building is going up, to where the first farms, taverns, and, uh, and you know hotels were put up back in the 1830s. But it brings us here to the junction, and in front of us, directly in front of us, you can see this gorgeous piece of sculpture with the arch at the bottom, uh, and then another arch up at the top that echoes it. This is River Point, designed by Picard Chilton, finished about four years ago. There's another train going by. I told you 500 times a day, right? Okay. And this was what was standing where River Point is now, just about five years ago, was a parking lot because in front of that building are railroad tracks. That's what's behind the concrete wall that you see right there with the round holes in it. The railroad tracks are still there. There's fans in some of those circular holes that are actually pulling the exhaust of the railroad cars out into the open air. So if people need to go in there to do repairs, they can do it and survive. And the beautiful red sculpture, which is new, is a Col uh, Santiago Calatrava sculpture called Constellation. It was just installed about a year ago. And, you know, it's, it's just a, the, the shape of it, and they managed to fit that building into a very, very tight space. And the, the railroad. 
So Captain Tom has now, uh, he's taken a right turn. We're gonna actually pass through back through the junction two more times after this. We're now heading north, which gives us a great view on your left of that big pink brick building. Okay, this is Fulton House. It was finished in 1898 and designed by Frank Abbott. Uh, this was originally a giant brick refrigerator. Okay, it was a cold storage warehouse. It stood that way for 80 years until it was converted into condominiums in the 80s. It took six months for the building to fall. They were afraid that it was gonna completely collapse because it had been frozen solid for 80 years. So they stuck a lot of steel rods through it and each of those little stars that you see on the edge is the end of a steel rod so it didn't collapse. And when they cut those balconies through it, because those weren't part of the refrigerator, trust me, those were for the condominiums. When they, You can see how thick the walls are when you look in those balconies. When they did the demolition, inside the walls they found horsehair and pork that had been used as insulating material back in 1898. So, you know, things get repurposed in very imaginative ways. The architect who did the conversion to condominiums, a man named Harry Weiss, then went on to quickly design this next set of townhomes on your left. Pay no attention to them, okay. Um, you can see the, the sloped roof. Harry Weiss is an avid sailor, so he just designed these river cottages, which were finished in 1988. He designed them with a nautical theme. The slopes look like sails, the porthole windows, and you can see the lucky people living there. One of the guys out, he's grilling. It's July 4th, he's doing what he ought to be doing. Yes, give him a wave. Now, I don't know if he'll hear me. <laughs> Very well done, thank you, Drew. Uh, that's a good location, as you can tell. Uh, not one of those townhomes, those four townhomes, changed hands publicly for about 30 years, and then a few years ago, one of the four townhomes was sold for about two and a half million bucks. So, you know, location, location, location. The area to our right is a neighborhood called River North that had, you know, sort of through the first half of the 20th century, sort of light industrial warehouses, a lot of railroads that went in there, and then it sort of fell into disuse. It was renewed starting in the 1970s, and he did it based on one simple insight. More and more goods were available in the cities, but all the people still lived on the farms. So he said, anything you buy from me, if you're not 100% satisfied with it, send it back and I'll give you back every penny of your money. And on the strength of that promise, he went from a one-page catalog in the 1870s to a 1,000-page catalog by, two, by 1900 with many thousands of items in it. The other thing that we thank Montgomery Ward for was defending our environment. He was very famous for that. Our lakefront, which I think, I hope many of you have visited or are going to visit, you know, that was threatened. That was supposed to be kept clean, but people tried to develop along our lakefront in front of the city. He sued them in court like four times, spent a lot of his own money to do it. He won every time. That's why the park that we're passing in front of is named Montgomery Ward Park because of his support for the environment and nature and keeping it available for the citizens of the city to be able to use. Overlooking this park is an interesting building, the one with the white triangles on it. It's an interesting example of how buildings stand up to the wind in the windy city. So most buildings do that by having columns placed throughout the building, and that's how the building stands up. Pretty typical. In this case, those triangles are part of an external skeleton, or an exoskeleton. That's how the building stands up and braces itself against the wind. And as a result, you have far fewer, if any, columns inside, and you can put your rooms and your furniture wherever you feel like. And that's a great thing. But you'll also see that those elements, those triangles, they give you sort of a partially obstructed view on some windows, so that's maybe what you give up. In most places, if you had a partially obstructed view, you'd probably pay less for that unit. But here in Chicago, you pay more because every time you look out your window, you get to see your architecture. A 
over many, many years, Montgomery Ward had several buildings in this area. The next two buildings I'm going to talk about were all part of his, his empire at different points in time. Uh, the one up ahead, the light-colored one with the steel balconies coming out on the side, was a headquarters building that was put up in 1930. Uh, it's since been converted to condominiums, and that's why the balconies were added. But it's a, re it's a good uh, opportunity to see that Art Deco look sort of up close. Remember I talked about how it always wants to look as tall as it can. So when you look at this building, you see the windows are sort of skinny and elongated. And again, the vertical elements between the windows go straight up uninterrupted. The ornamentation, the darker colored stone with the butterfly and floral pattern on it, again, plus to the side of the building. So it's even though this building isn't particularly tall, it's doing everything it can to look as tall as it can. And it provides an interesting contrast to the next building, just on the other side of this bridge, with the brick red bands going horizontally across. This was Montgomery Ward's catalog building. <laughs> but you sort of get a nice side-by-side -side here. These buildings are pretty much the same height, but you know, to my eye, okay, maybe, happy July 4th. To my eye, the Art Deco building just sort of Nate appears to be taller, even though it's pretty much the same size. Same height. Not the same size. This building called the Catalog Building, those tens of thousands of items in the 1,000-page catalog from Montgomery Ward were all stocked in this building, which was at those times the Catalog Warehouse, finished in 1906 and then expanded in 1908. And later on, there's a whole newer section further out that expanded even further. Biggest building in the world when it was completed because that's how much space Montgomery Ward needed. Now, inside, as I said, inside that building, every one of those thousands of items was stocked in a bin. And there were people who worked for Montgomery Ward who were called pickers. And their job was to take an order and go out and pick each item that was in that order until the order was filled, then take it down to the mail room to send it to whichever farm had ordered it. But that's a very, very big building, biggest building in the world at the time. So how do you think those pickers got their job done? Well, they'd get to work around 7 a.m., strap on their roller skates and go roller skating in and out the aisles, picking out each item that needed to be picked out until they had the order filled and sent it on its way. And there was, there's, there's, over the years, there's been suspicion that is that, you know, sort of an urban legend and it sounds good, but it's not true. But this building has, you know, it's also been converted. It's now the head of group, the headquarters for Groupon, as you can see, and uh, the newer part is condominiums. Again, when they did the demolition in there, they really did find artifacts and roller skates from back in the day. And the architecture center a few years ago even received a letter from a woman who said that her brother had been a picker and he really did strap on the roller skates every day. And part of what you see on the right-hand side here coming up are sort of two steel doors. Those were garage doors that were put in at the beginning of the construction so that boats with newsprint could pull right up to the garage door and offload the newsprint directly onto the presses for a very efficient operation. When the Corps of Engineers came in to figure out how much of the bottom of the river they had to dig out so that the boats could come in and do their offloading, they realized that they would have, there was so much pollution accumulated on the bottom of the river that they weren't going to do it and the garage doors were never used. But speaking of pollution on the river, which I've talked about a couple of times now, it's time to come back to our flag. The two blue bars on the Chicago City flag stand for two bodies of water, Lake Michigan and the Chicago River, which were the key to Chicago achieving its dream. And the dream of Chicago, from its earliest exploration, was to find a way for ships to go from the Atlantic coast, through the Great Lakes, down Lake Michigan to Chicago, along the Chicago River, and then to find a connection to the Mississippi and down to the Gulf of Mexico. They knew that if they could open up that pathway, Chicago would become the commercial hub at the center of the country with all the wood and the meat and the grain from the heartland passing through here on its way to the population centers on the East Coast. And they did it. 1848, they dug a canal where the Native Americans had shown them was the smartest place to dig it, and the growth of the city just took off. 
There were literally thousands of people moving here every week, but that had some unforeseen consequences. Especially since many of you are visitors, you've probably noticed it's really flat around here, you know? Welcome to the Midwest, okay? But off to your right, further than you can see, is a little ridge that's all of about 14 feet or four meters high. And because of that ridge, the Chicago River has always flowed east to your left into Lake Michigan, which wasn't a problem since the last ice age, but it became a problem when all those people moved here and started using the river as an open sewer. They threw everything in here, pulp from the wood mill, any part of the butchered hog they couldn't sell in the marketplace, and everyone's human waste went into this river back in the day. Now, that is really disgusting, but it becomes dangerous when you consider that the river flows into the lake and the lake is the city's source of drinking water, okay? So you can see where this story's going. 1885, big rainstorm sends a wave of polluted river water into the lake and within a few weeks, hundreds of people are dead of cholera, okay? And the city leaders say, well, this is, this is it. This is gonna stop us in our tracks. At which point the engineers, who are always the heroes in these kinds of stories, step up and say, we think we can reverse the flow of the river. The city leaders say, never heard of anybody doing that anyplace else, but we don't have a better idea, so let's give it a try. Thousands of people work every day southwest of the city to build a canal, to dig out a canal that is wider and deeper so that gravity will pull the water of, Lake, of the Chicago River away from Lake Michigan and towards the Mississippi. They move more earth than was moved in building the Panama Canal, okay? But it takes a while, it takes about eight years. And during that time, some other people are getting a little concerned, particularly the people of St. Louis, which is down the Mississippi River from Chicago, and not interested in having all of Chicago's muck end up on their riverfront. So they say, we're gonna sue you in the US Supreme Court. And the whole thing becomes a bit of a race. You know, will Chicago finish the project first, or will St. Louis stop them in the courts? January 2nd, 1900, freezing cold, typical Chicago winter day. Hardy group of Chicagoans go out early in the morning to where the channel, the new channel is being dug. They break through the last earthen barrier, channel fills up, they raise the last man-made barrier, and a couple of weeks later, the Chicago River starts to flow back. And on that very same day, St. Louis files its lawsuit, okay? Well, the river's flowing backward, and that's not going to change too quickly. The lawsuit flows forward, as lawsuits tend to do. And in a few years, the Supreme Court essentially ruled that St. Louis couldn't prove its water was any filthier after Chicago's <laughs> project than it had been before. So Chicago won the lawsuit. Rivers flowed backward every, ever since. But as I have said before, a ton of work has gone into cleaning up the river huge filtration systems that continue to be expanded to this day. We had six species of fish in the river back in the 60s. Today, we have nearly 60 species of fish in the river, and according to the people who manage all the water here, you come back in a few years, bring your swimsuit, we're all gonna jump in the river and go for a little swim the next time we take this cruise. Now, the reason I enjoy, did you tell I enjoy telling that story? The reason I enjoy telling that story, not just because it's one of the great engineering feats to this day, but it's a, I've talked about how neighborhoods are renewed, like River North, how buildings are renewed. That's a story of how the river itself was renewed so that Chicago could continue to grow. So some of you are probably noticing the, the open bridge. We passed under it before, it's just ahead of us. Uh, this is a railroad bridge, it's just open and closed one day a year to make sure that it's not used for the railroad on a routine basis. They open and close it one day a year, sorry, it's not today, this year, otherwise we get to see some real magic. Um, but it stays open, but it does give us a chance to see how our seesaw bridges work. They work like seesaws with a heavy weight on one side and the roadway itself on the other. As we go by it, take a look on uh, the left-hand side of the bridge, you'll see a big yellow cement block. And that's essentially the counterweight to the roadway itself. And when it's time to close the roadway, they turn on a motor that's surprisingly small. It's a 
point because they're very, very well balanced. And, you know, it acts like a seesaw to go up and go down. So we're, we're coming back to the junction. I know, you're, you're going to outbid him for the, what did I tell you, two and a half? <laughs> uh, we're coming back to uh, the junction, Wolf Point. Again, the historic center of, uh, the historic heart of the city back in the 1830s. You can see these columns here on the left, the steel columns that come right down to the river walk. It was put in three buildings uh, are now, you know, the, there's this one here is residential. The third one that's finished in the dist off to your left is uh, also residential. The one in the middle that's under construction right now will be the tallest. That's going to be salesforce.com tower here in Chicago. And um, what was there five, six years ago? A couple of parking lots because it was a lot of space. So let's put two or three parking lots in there. And as we come back into the junction of the river, I want you to try to take a look. You see the railing going across and look on every other piece of uh, section of railing. You can see sort of a circle with what looks like the letter Y in the middle of that circle. It's a little easier to see when we go in front of these beige colored steps. That is the municipal symbol of Chicago, okay? And it's the shape of the junction that we are passing through right now, that Y shape. But I'll admit, it's a little, it's not that easy to sort of get a sense of that shape from here. Stand by, we'll give you an aerial view from the river in just a little while of the shape of this junction. The, the building on the right, this is 150 North Riverside, the one that goes out sort of like a champagne glass. Stunning building, extraordinary structural engineering to make that building stand on that tiny little footprint and then go up over 50 stories. I'm going to talk more about it when we come back. That was just finished four years ago as well, designed by Getz Partners, Chicago based architecture firm. And you're going to get uh, that means July 4th. Uh, you'll get a nice look at it here. We will come back and I'll tell you more about it when we come back through. You can see from the from the fourth to the eighth floor goes out to three times the width of that skinny little postage stamp footprint. Uh, it's amazing design. One of the early skyscraper designers had a definition for skyscraper. He said a skyscraper is a machine to make the land pay because you get more space on the same amount of land. Okay, this building coming up on the left with the very dramatic sort of trident, three-pronged shaped columns at the base. This is the Bank of America Tower, also designed by Getch Partners, finished last year. What stood there two or three years ago, not a parking lot, but a seven-story building. It was not making the land pay nearly as much as the 40 and 50-story towers surrounding it. So. With the uh, in the uh, what's the, what's the word the impressible force of real estate economics, the seven-story building, you know, came down. They've saved some parts of it in a beautiful way, and now we have this lovely tower going up here with its own nice river walk. The other side of the bridge taking up a full block here between the bridges is the Civic Opera Building designed by Graham Anderson Probst and White finished in 1929 uh, as a home for the opera and they had a brilliant idea opera not famously profitable so they surrounded the theater with office towers on all three sides you can see the tallest one going up way behind the theater itself great idea bad timing the, the stock market crash of 1929 came six days after the first performance of this opera. They struggled for a number of years, didn't make it, abandoned the theater, but happily the Lyric Opera reoccupied the theater, which is an opulent, beautiful theater. Come back when they're performing in the fall and you can take a look at it. Uh, and the Lyric is uh, one of the most financially and artistically successful opera companies in the country, and they're going strong in that lovely theater.
We have a really fun lineup. I don't know, I just felt like I looked at it afresh. This lineup on your right, four buildings in a row, match set here, and then the white checkerboard one, and then the one just beyond that. These are all from the same firm, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, 60s, 70s, 80s, and they show how mid-century modern architecture evolved during those 30 years. So the first two, the match set from the 60s, pure Mesian modernism. Dark steel, dark glass, perfectly rectangular, flat top. Hard to see from here, but if you were at the street level, you know, the, the ground floor of the lobby is recessed and enclosed in glass. So it makes the building look a little bit like exploding above the, the ground. Uh, so that's sort of following all the rules, if you will, of mid-century modernism. And this, we call it originally the Gateway 1 and 2, Gateway 3, the next one on the right, with the white sort of checkerboard pattern. First thing is, it's white, it's not dark steel, and that reflects concrete that was used in addition to the steel framing as a structural uh, decision. Still very rectangular in every way. Uh, and as we come out from under the bridge, we'll see a smaller building sort of at the back of it uh, that's all black, and it's got sort of an X on the side of it. And this is very similar, remember the building with the white triangle, the exoskeleton? We've got the same thing going on here. That little building was originally, and when it was finished in the 70s, was the trading floor for the Chicago Mercury where they still did open call trading, where you used hand signals and eye contact to close your trades. So they needed a wide open space, so the exoskeleton gave them what they needed, no columns to block those important sight lines. The Merc is not in there now, it's all digital. They got another building a few blocks up the river. And then the last installation and sort of evolution of mid-century modern, Gateway 4, this last building here, starts to be a little postmodern. It's got the curved shape, so it's no longer perfectly rectangular. Uh, and then one nice touch is you, as you come up and look at the glass windows, uh, they're sort of pinched at the corners and it makes the light play off the windows the same way that the light plays off the water in the river in front of the building. So again, it's that postmodern idea of reflecting the environment around the building. And next on the right, this huge monolithic Art Deco, massive building. This is the old post office. Biggest post office in the world, finished in 1925. Graham Anderson, Probst and White. It looks great these days because it's been renewed in the last year and a half. It had fallen into disrepair. It was abandoned in 1996 because you know mail processing had changed and it just no longer worked well. But now you've got Walgreens and Cisco Systems and Uber, oh, and True Blue and Home Chef. I'm reading the sign here. Um, you know, they're occupying it as an office building. They can get on one floor, they can get 2,000 employees. So it's nice from a company culture standpoint to have everybody alongside each other. The, uh, the bridge we're about to pass under, you can see some vehicles going by. From here, it looks like they're driving straight into the building. They're not, don't worry, but there's a great story behind that, okay? So when the architecture firm Graham Anderson, Probst and White was designing this building in the early 20s, they looked back at Burnham's plan for the city, which was only about 10 or 11 years old, and Burnham's plan showed an expressway right here. It wasn't there at the time, but the architect said, well, Burnham said it will be, so they left a hole in the bottom of the building. Finally, 25 years later, the expressway goes in, it goes straight through the hole, and everything works perfectly, okay? I used to write, you know, strat strategic plans in business. None of them came close to being that good over a 25 year period. So hats off to Daniel Burnham for doing a great job there. Coming up ahead on the left, many of you can see it, you'll see it very well in just a minute, 
is a building with that's got a you know sort of rounded shape with eyebrow windows. Uh, this is River City, designed by a man named Bertrand Goldberg, uh, finished in 1986. Uh, and Goldberg was a student of Mies van der Rohe, but he departed from him in some very important ways. First of all, he, he said, look, there are no right angles in nature, so he liked the curved sort of organic shapes in all of his buildings, and he used concrete to achieve that. And he also believed in the vitality of cities. So as so many people were fleeing to the suburbs after World War II, he wanted to give them a reason to stay in the city. So in addition to apartments here, and you'll see boat docks down at the river level, there's doctor's offices, child care centers, retail stores. It's really a whole place to live, work, and play inside River City, and it's continued to perform well for all of its residents ever since then. Okay, flag time again. Second red star, the Chicago Fire, October 1871. The city is a tinderbox. There's been very little rain for two or three months. A big wind is blowing in from the southwest. And the city itself is made of wood entirely. You know, even the sidewalks and the streets are planks of wood laid down on the ground. Fire starts over on your right. The firefighters come to stop it. They don't think that it can make it across the river. But the wind is so strong and the fire is so fierce with its own little infernos jumping that it jumps across the river here, burns through the heart of the city, jumps the river on the north side, keeps burning for 30 hours till there's nothing left to burn. Takes out 17,000 homes, buildings, and leaves 100,000 of 300,000 people homeless. Huge tragedy. A few days later, the newspaper reports that it was Mrs. O'Leary who was milking her cow Daisy in her barn Daisy kicked over the lamp, and that's what started the fire. She denied it. She said, it's not true. I was asleep in bed at the time, but the story stuck, and she lived in shame and seclusion the rest of her life. And the place that she lived and where her dairy barn sat is that red and white communications antenna over there on your right. So she lived in shame and seclusion, even though the reporter admitted a few years later that he made up the story to sell newspapers and to give people someone to blame, okay? Really crummy, right? Fortunately, Mrs. O'Leary's descendants never gave up on her. They kept after the Chicago City Council who did a thorough investigation in the 1990s of the Great Chicago Fire. They were never able to say for sure what did start the fire, but they did fully exonerate Mrs. O'Leary and her cow Daisy from any responsibility for the Chicago Fire. So Captain Tom has us turned around. This is, I'm gonna take a pause here. This is just a beautiful site. And uh, there's a couple of tall buildings I'll be talking about in a few minutes. Great photo op here, guys. So the, the fire was a, a you know, people read about it all over the world at the time. It was a huge tragedy. Fortunately, very few people lost their lives in the fire. But it, it sort of, but it had an unforeseen benefit. Because it sort of cleared the decks in Chicago for what would become its period of most extraordinary growth. They started rebuilding the city literally the next day. All the architects at the time, Frank Lloyd Wright, Daniel Burnham, Louis Sullivan, they all came here because they knew Chicago was going to need to rebuild itself and nothing was going to slow it down. But they faced one problem after just a few years. They quickly rebuilt the central business district downtown, but then they were hemmed in. They had the lake on one side, the river on two other sides, the stockyard on the fourth side. The only way Chicago could keep growing was to go up. Chicago needed to invent the skyscraper. So about 15 years after the fire, the first steel frame skyscraper in the world went up here in Chicago. And now we have in front of us two exquisite examples of how skyscraper te technology developed in its first 100 years. The two that I'm talking about, many of you probably recognize the Dark Tower with the two white antennas, the Willis Tower, originally the Sears Tower. And then I'm also going to talk about the one immediately in front of it with the pink uh, granite stone around it. Let's talk about first the Sears Tower. I'm going to talk about it as the Sears Tower. So this was designed by Bruce Graham and Fosler Kahn. 
and it's uh, and they finished it in 1974. And this is a super tall building. So I've talked a little bit about how buildings stand up to the wind of the Windy City. When you're a super tall building like this, going up to 110 stories, that problem becomes exponentially greater. So it's a good thing that Fosler Khan was a structural engineering genius who came up with two innovations so this building could be as tall as it is. The first is something called bundled tube construction. And here's a simple way to think about it. If you hold up one pencil between your hands and try to break it, you can probably break it. If you hold up nine pencils together between your hands and try to break them, you can't break it. And that's what the Sears is. Nine separate columns, each attached to the other, each giving the other one strength. That's one of the ways it stands up to the wind. The second innovative solution was to have those columns end at different heights so that as the wind hits the building, it's partially deflected and it never exerts its full force against one face of the building. Only two of the nine towers go all the way up to 110 stories. So those two innovations have been copied all over the world by super tall buildings since they were invented here in the 70s. This was the tallest building in the world for nearly 25 years. Today, it's not even in the top 20. It's been outstripped by one or two buildings in New York City and many buildings in the Mideast and the Far East. But it is still the tallest building here in Chicago and it is a great ornament on our skyline. You know, you look here at night, it's, it's unmistakable. Beautiful building, and the, the two white, those are communication antennas way up on the top. And as we get closer to it, in case you haven't seen it, you'll, you'll get a better view, and you'll be able to see the three by three nine columns. So now let's talk about uh, pretty in pink, the building immediately in front of that. Imagine you're an architect working at the Sean Petters in the box in the 80s. Your phone rings, it's your boss, and your boss says, I've got good news and bad news. Good news is, we want you to design a brand new skyscraper in the heart of downtown Chicago. Bad news is, it's right in front of the Sears Tower, currently the world's tallest and most celebrated building. And by the way, you can't be taller than the Sears because we don't have enough money for that. So what do you do? Well, what you don't do is try to beat the Sears at its own game. So, Instead of dark steel and dark glass, you go with pink granite and aluminum for the, for the window. Instead of every single window being exactly the same size and pattern, you mix it up with sizes and ranges. Instead of being perfectly square, you go with a sort of irregular octagonal shape. And instead of having two buddy ears up on the top, Don't worry, birds find their way home. They're very good at that. But now you can see them standing side by side, only about 15 years apart, but dramatically different from each other. Uh, and you can also now get a good sense of the three by three structure of the Sears, the nine columns. And if you look way up near the top, you, on the left-hand side of the Sears, you can see those, those things sticking out near the top. Did anybody go up there to the ledge? I see somebody. <laughs> few people, oh, very, a lot of brave people here, looking straight down through the glass, 103 stories. Yeah, it's yours if you want. <laughs> it's quite an experience. So I promised you an aerial view from a boat. It's time for me to, get, to keep that promise. Next building here on the right, take a look at the left-hand side. You see the red rectangle up there? You are there. Just for fun, this building was rehabbed and redesigned a few years ago. They put a map of the city on it. The dark stone is the land. White stone is the river and the water. Red rectangle is the building we're passing in front of. And then way up at the top, you can see the Y shape of the junction that we passed through. And the local pundits, when they did that, and it's fun, there was no, there's no purpose in it other than to be enjoyable. Uh, they said, well, if you want to put your map on the building, put a build, no, if you want to put your building on the map, if you want to put your building on the map, put a map on your building. I should have asked somebody else to think. But uh, it worked out very well, all the people walking across the bridge have a fun time looking at it.
Chicago invented the skyscraper, and it gave them another 30 or 40 years of growth over on your right. And then they ran out of space again. And then they looked over here, and what did they find? A spaghetti bowl of railroad tracks coming in from all parts of the country. They said, well, you know, if we could figure out a way to build on top of those, we'd have new landscape to develop and more money to make. And that's where those caissons come back into play. If they can find a place between the tracks to sink those caissons down to bedrock under the river, fill them with concrete, then they've got a foundation that they can build on top of. And I'm going to talk about three buildings now on the left-hand side of the river, each of them with just amazing structural engineering that use that technology to build on top of the railroad tracks, which you can see are still there and still used. Up ahead on the left, at about 11 o'clock, you can see the red brick go-go building. Immediately to the right of that is a building with a bunch of white beams up on top of it. That's the Boeing building, designed by Perkins and Will, finished in 1990. This is a building standing on three legs. They put the caissons on the right-hand side in the back left corner. When they went to find a space to put the caissons at the front left corner, there wasn't any place to put them. Those beams up on the top support the front left corner from above. It's a little, I'm not an engineer. I had to have this explained to me about 12 times before I got it. But that structure on top is holding up and supporting the front left corner of the building where there was no room for a caisson. And again, in most places, you know, those are just beams. You'd sort of hide them. But here in Chicago, you know, we love our architecture. So we put the engineering solutions right out there on display. The first building to use the caisson technology over the railroad tracks is the one coming up here on the left to North Riverside Plaza, the Art Deco Tower that goes, you can see the name on it right there, uh, just on the other side of this bridge. Uh, and as we come out from under the bridge, you'll see there's sort of a, a park, you'll see the trees on it, there's a public plaza in front of the building. And that's a, a, a part, and that's where those caissons are supporting the structure. This was the first building to give it a try back in 1929. You know, they got dance, they don't got architecture. What can I tell you? But this went up in 1929, designed by Holliburton and Root. First building to try that technology, and it worked, and so it's spread all around the river since then. And it's also a very elegant uh, you know, example of Art Deco, again, sort of sweeping up, emphasizing its verticality. So now we're going to come back, and now I get a chance to talk about the Champagne Flute Building, or the it's ballerina on point. You've heard all these metaphors before. but. Uh, this was finished four years ago. So the arch I went to a lecture a few years ago. The architect said the site designed the building because they had to have the river walk on the right. There's a public, the railroad tracks are over on the left of it. All they had was a 39 foot or 13 meter footprint at the bottom. That's, and all of that gray concrete in the middle goes straight down, it fills it up. And that's what that building stands on. It goes out to three times that width from the fourth to the eighth floor, and then all the way up over 50 stories. And it's all sitting on that tiny footprint. The angled beams are like 40% stronger than any beams that had ever been used before in US construction. Uh, but that's not the wildest part about this building, okay? How do buildings stand up to the wind of the Windy City? Way up at the top of the building inside, can't see it from here, are a set of giant swimming pools so that when the wind blows the building this way, the water sloshes back the other way and the building doesn't move as much on its back. It's called a tuned mass damper and it's another structural solution for stabilizing buildings. And it's not the first building, to do, it was the first building I think to do that in Chicago. And I'll give you one guess. Before that building went up, what do you suppose occupied that space? Parking a lot, very good, you guys are great. So we're coming back to the junction here. Now you get a, a great look as we come under the bridge. Salesforce Tower will be the tallest of those three towers in Gold Point. So I want you to imagine this junction here. 
six and a half years ago, what you would have seen was on the right, our lovely green lady, curved front. She'd been standing there for 30 years with no one to talk to, surrounded by parking lots. Since then, all those parking lots have been filled, some of them still in the process of being filled, by these wonderful new buildings, really creating this radiant architectural conversation at the heart of the city. It's just a tremendous renewal. The other thing that I really feel good about, all these new buildings, each of them is LEED certified. So LEED is Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It's how buildings are made more sustainable by using less energy, less water, and less building materials over the lifetime of a building. Illinois has more LEED certified buildings per capita than any other state in the U.S which is a great thing because it's the right thing for the planet. Chicago sort of is helping that performance to be what it is, and we intend to keep it up. So it's really fun going back through this junction. On the left, another enormous Art Deco round limestone monolith. This was originally the Merchandise Mart, built in 1930, designed by Graham Anderson, Crokes and White. It was built by Marshall Field, one of those other retailing tycoons from Chicago, <clears throat> as a showroom both for his own wholesale as well as other wholesale showrooms. Biggest building in the world when it was finished. Very elegant, you can see all the Chevron designs and the central tower. Again, big bold idea. Bad timing, finished in 1930, straight into the teeth of the Depression. So Marshall Field and his estate paid $39 million to build that building when they, they had to sold, sell it basically in bankruptcy 15 years later for $13 million. That's a tough hit. The buyer was Joseph Kennedy, President Kennedy's father. Kennedy family managed the building for many years, finally sold it off in the early 90s for $625 million. Bucks. So, a good return. Probably better than the returns of the, uh, the bootlegging business that Joseph Kennedy is supposed to have been in back in the day. So we've got a really good view of one of my favorite buildings. It's up ahead at one o'clock. You can see it, it's a, a, got a green shaft and then a gold top, pretty unmistakable there, okay? You never know what will inspire an architect's design for a building. So this is the Carbide and Carbon building, finished in 1929, designed by the Burnham brothers, Daniel Burnham's sons. So, you know, it's the end of the Roaring Twenties, a lot of partying going on. We believe that the Burnham brothers were no strangers to Chicago nightlife, where the beverage of choice was champagne. So what better to model your building after than a bottle of champagne, which is true, they really did model it after that. The biggest difference between this bottle of champagne and one that you might have at home in your refrigerator is that the gold cap on this one is real 24 karat gold. Very thin layer, but nonetheless, the real thing. Remember our friend Bertrand Goldberg, eyebrow windows, curved shape, city within a city? Here's his, the, the first one he did here in Chicago, the one with the corn cob building here. Uh, this is Marina City, built from 1959 to 67. I always feel bad when I call it a corn cob because, you know, he had much more beautiful metaphors. He thought of these, <coughs> the residential towers as trees, where the central column is the trunk of the tree, the floor plates are the branches, and the balconies are the leaves on the end of the branches. I like that, that metaphor much better. This city within a city has the House of Blues, it's got a hotel, it's got restaurants, and the lower, and it is, you know, it's become a real icon of Chicago. I'm sure many of you see, it just shows up in all the pictures. And as you can see, all the parking, parking is at the lower level, so the residents have better views from higher up. And it's also valet parking only here at Marina City, because we don't want people backing into the river. And in an interesting 
counterpoint, Bertrand Goldberg, student of Mies van der Rohe, these buildings of his, Marina City, sit next to the AMA, the next building on the left, Mies van der Rohe's final design before he passed away, originally the IBM building, now AMA Plaza, finished in 1971. Just a very, you know, again, pure modernism, dark steel, dark glass, but very gracefully proportioned. And Mies also set it back a bit so that it wouldn't block the views from Marina City. But there is a story that when Mies saw the drawings for Bertrand Goldberg's Marina City, he sort of said, you know, in, in no uncertain terms, he said, Bertrand, you and I have parted ways. For us now, but it's great to just see, again, I, I told you at the beginning, buildings that stand right next to each other but couldn't be more different. There you have it. Coming up on the left, the Trump International Hotel and Tower, designed by Adrian Smith, Chicago-based architect. Uh, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit here, and then again from a different vantage point. The one thing that this building does beautifully, and it's a beautiful contemporary design, he's the same man who designed the world's current tallest building in Dubai, and the shape is very similar, but this building connects its neighborhood in a way that the previous building didn't. It sort of cut things off from each other, but you've got this, this three-level river walk going straight across through those trees, through the Wrigley Building, straight out to Michigan Avenue. So everything is very nicely connected. And that was a great accomplishment of this, this building. But up ahead on the left, at about 11 o'clock, just across the street from the Wrigley Building with its, with its July 4th flag hanging there, Another building with a flag way up at the top that looks like a, almost like a Renaissance cathedral up on the top. This is the Tribune Tower. This building is the outcome of a global competition. Colonel McCormick, who owned the Chicago Tribune, announced in the early 1920s that he would have the most beautiful office building in the world. He invited anyone to submit their plans. He would pick the winner, and he would give the winner what was then the equivalent of a million dollars. Okay. He got in over 200 submissions from dozens of different countries. The winners were two architects from New York named Howells and Hood, who partnered specifically for this competition. And they sort of knew what McCormick would like, an Art Deco shaft going cleanly up, and then with that Renaissance cathedral kind of appearance up at the top, and those upside down L's near the top, you know, those are what are called flying buttresses on Renaissance cathedrals. They're there to hold up the topmost tower. In this case, they're not holding up anything. They're purely decorative. They're not structural, but Howells and Hood made the right bet. They knew that McCormick would like those flying buttresses. He picked them and they got the million bucks. And in an interesting echo of that, the next building on the left that I wanna point out with the white spire at the front and the NBC peacock at the base of the spire as you can guess, this is the NBC Tower here in Chicago. Those of you who've seen Rockefeller Center in New York City, it may sort of remind you of that. It's, you know, uh, Adrian Smith is the designer of this building as well, finished in 1990. Uh, he calls it heritage style, but it's clearly evoking, you know, that look from uh, the Art Deco era. Uh, but those upside down L's halfway up the building are a explicit nod to the flying buttresses on the Tribune Tower, which sits across the plaza from the NBC Tower. So these buildings, they're sort of talking to each other, giving a little acknowledgement. to renew that underdeveloped area. 
This part on the left is called Lake Shore East, uh, and that plan was developed by Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill back in the 70s. And you can see that, again, back in the 70s, river not so nice, we ended up with a three-level road, Wacker Drive there, and making it very difficult to get from those buildings that are part of Lake Shore East over to the river because, you know, nobody wanted to be in the river. We're here to it. Again, big contrast to what you see on your left. These planned developments were planned about 20, 25 years later. River's much nicer. And the folks who live in these townhouses, they can walk out their front door, walk 100 meters up the river walk, have a burger and beer, and just be outside and enjoy that connection every minute of the day. You're also seeing the very last section of the Riverwalk here on the right. This was finished up really during the pandemic last year, and it now goes about a mile and a half, two and a half kilometers for all the way from the lakefront up ahead to the junction of the river. Uh, so it's, it's, and it's taken well, officially, you know, 17 years, but really longer than that to really complete this whole traverse. So we can walk that off. And then of course the Lakefront Trail goes miles and miles down the lake. Building up ahead on the left, black and white, curvy shape, three lobes, big disc up on the top. This building should not be standing where it is. Okay? I mentioned earlier in the context of Montgomery Ward that there have been rules for over a century in Chicago about protecting the riverfront and that nothing would be developed on the lakefront on the other side of Lakeshore Drive. Okay? Well, we're just about to pass under the Lakeshore Drive Bridge. That building is on the other side of it. So how did it get there? In the early 60s, a developer somehow found a loophole in those rules about not building on the lakefront. They seized on it. They hired two architects named Shippelwright and Heinrich who had studied under Mies van der Rohe, but also gone off a bit in their own direction with the curvy shape. Uh, they put up the building, Lake Point Tower, was finished in 1968, and not long after that, the loophole was closed. As a result, the people who are lucky enough and affluent enough to live in Lake Point Tower have unrivaled views of the river, the lake, and the city, going in all directions. Nothing, nothing has been put up yet <laughs> to obstruct those views. Something almost happened just before the 2008 financial collapse, but, and that may yet happen again at a spot just uh, back behind us and to our left. Uh, but for now, uh, those folks there have a little bit of a city within a city for themselves. Nice restaurant up on top and a lot of retail down at the base. I think this is the first time I've been out when the Ferris wheel has been going this year more signs of wonderful renewal. So the Ferris wheel sits on Navy Pier. Many of you may have already visited that. That was finished in 1916, designed by Charles Frost, and it served many different roles in its lifetime. Uh, you know, it had uh, commercial docks in it. It was a naval training station for Navy flyers during World War II, which is when it was rechristened Navy Pier. And then it was made back into a tourist destination in the 80s and 90s. And it's currently, I believe, the second most visited destination in the state. And the Ferris wheel was put in new in 2016 to mark the 100th anniversary of the pier. Uh, and it's bigger than the one that was there before, but it isn't nearly as big as the very first Ferris wheel, which brings us to the third star on the Chicago City flag. The first Ferris wheel, designed by George Washington Ferris, appeared at the World Columbia, World's Fair and Columbian Exposition of 1893, which took place right here, about 20 years after the fire burned the city to the ground. Chicago had rebuilt itself and was ready to show off to the world that they had complete command of all the greatest technologies of the day. And it was the event of, if not, certainly the decade, if not the century, 30 million people came to the fair in a, in a country that had not that many people in it at the time. 
and you know people would come from the farms and they'd go up on the Ferris wheel, which was one third again bigger than that one. It was sort of an attempt to out Eiffel the Eiffel Tower, which had appeared four years before in Paris. And not as tall as the Eiffel Tower, but Ferris wheel moves. You decide which is cooler. And it was one of the most popular attractions at that fair. So Captain Tom has turned us around, and ladies and gentlemen, I give you Chicago. Up those speaking of heads up, the heads may be locked down in just a couple of minutes if you need to use them. 